one. guys. Back from your winter break, huh? I started teaching last week to the undergraduates and on Wednesday the one thing I cannot live without failed. Guess what it was? The sound. The sound system crashed. So I'm a little fran I was a little frantic this morning saying because if they hadn't fixed it this morning I was going to resign and move away. Because if I taught three classes, because I teach three classes back to back to back in this room. In fact, this is the only room I've taught in for 20 years. And I can't teach without a, without a sound system. So is it loud enough? Uh, OK, good. So uh, let's get started. How many, I was going to ask how many MBA ones are there, but that would be the wrong question. How many people are not MBA ones in this class? Okay, so in fact, could you keep your hands up for just a moment? I'm not trying to pick on you, but the MBA ones might be a kind of exclusionary group, so when you try to form groups, you might find yourself excluded. So one of the things I'm going to do is start what I call an orphan list, <laughs> which is if you can't find a group, you can join the orphan list. And if, there are enough, if there's enough of a critical mass in the orphan list, you can create an orphan group. I know it sounds pathetic. You know? So don't worry. You know, you, even if you're not an MBA one, you're going to be OK. So. But the rest of your MBA ones, right? And this is corporate finance. This is really the only class that matters in the entire program, I'll be quite honest with you. <laughs> Everything else is noise on the outskirts. Which means I'm going to treat like this like the only class you're taking this semester. I'm going to take over your lives. And if the other instructors complain, tough. Right. So let's get the, the, the show rolling. For some reason, my remote seems to jump along even though I'm not touching it. So let's start with the administrative stuff. My office is in the other building, 969. And my phone number is there, but I never answer my phone. My voicemail has become really full. I don't even know how to check it, so don't call me. It's going to be useless. If you want to get in touch with me, the easiest way to do it is by email. I respond fairly quickly, so if you have any questions, any issues, email is probably the easiest way to find me. The office hours are built around Mondays and Wednesdays because I've discovered that's when people want to come to office hours because your classes are those days. I don't know what you do the rest of the days of the week. But I'm going to make 
a suggestion that's going to sound weird. If you really want to have, you have questions to ask me, try not to find me during office hours. I, what I call the fair game principle. And here's how it goes. If you find me, I'm fair game. Which means for the next 15 weeks, here's the way it's going to go. I'm going to try to get away from you, and you're going to try to find me. <laughs> One of the things I try to do is take the stairs every day, because I've discovered that most people are too lazy to take the stairs. In spite of all the, the purple, you know, the footsteps on, they, they want you to take. So if you want to catch me, one of the things you might want to do is consider taking the stairs. And if you get me around the sixth or the seventh floor, it's going to be difficult because my heart rate might be too high for me to control what I say. In fact, one semester, the Cold Center, which is they've demolished now, they're building some monstrosity there, used to be the gym for NYU. In the middle of the day, I used to go to the gym. And somebody from this class would show up at exactly the time I was at the gym, get on the next treadmill and ask me corporate finance questions. <laughs> hey. If it's fair game, I, you know, I can't say no, but you know, as I said, my pulse rate exceeds 100. I can't be responsible for the answers I give you. But the problem is you, you, your complaint should never be that you can't find me. You will be able to find me and ask me any questions. So there cannot be any unresolved questions in 15 weeks. There are two TAs for the class, TF, TA. I don't know what the politically correct word is. I think TF is what they prefer to be called. Flavia and Maurizio. I would decide to go with the Latin American contingent in this class. <laughs> They're great because they took this class and the valuation class last spring. So they, are, they know the stuff. They really are good at teaching. And they will run review sessions every week for those of you, because I will never work through a problem in class. That's not what these classes are for, because we have too much stuff to cover. So what they will do is take problems from past quizzes and exams and work it through review sessions for those of you who are finding trouble with the mechanics. So I'll send out a Google shared spreadsheet. In fact, this is the last session where you will see physical handouts in this class, and for a good reason. It's a logistical nightmare. Right? People are coming and going. So anything that you get from this point on will be a PDF file or a physical f or a digital file that you can then download to your iPad. You don't have to print it off. So pretty much everything after this you will be doing online. I told you I was going to take over the next 15 weeks. I'll show you how. Here's how it's going to go. A typical week will start with a Monday, like every week does. <coughs> Class will be over, and sometime after class, you get an email telling you, what, telling you what we did in class. You're saying, but I know what we did in class. I was in class. Well, you might have been in class physically, but mentally you might have been somewhere else, or you might not have been in class. So basically, it's a review of this is what we did in class today, and perhaps suggestions on what you can do with that material. On Tuesday, you get what I call a corporate finance puzzle. Sounds deep, but it's not that deep. In fact, if you've looked at the webcast page for this class, the first puzzle is already up there. And I'll give you a preview. About six months ago, the Business Roundtable, composed of CEOs of some of the biggest US companies, stated that the objective of companies should be to maximize stakeholder wealth, one of the stupidest and most misdirected statements ever. And already you're saying, what a moral pygmy. He's not even thinking about the big picture. We're going to talk about why it's impossible to maximize the interests of seven different groups, all with very different objectives. So the first corporate finance puzzle is, I'm going to give you the business roundtable statement. I wrote a blog post. I'm very 21st century on this thing, on it. I'll give you that. And then I'm going to ask you questions where you can decide. Now, I'm not going to be shy about holding back. I'm not going to say on the one hand or the other hand. So if I've if I believe something, I'm going to say, this is what I believe. But I don't want you to believe the same thing. In fact, I don't expect you to. So the corporate finance puzzles will take something that's happening in a company or in a macro environment and say, what does this mean? Yeah. So the puzzle is really to get you thinking. It's completely optional, which means most of you will never try it. But I'm OK with that, because there will be parts of this class where I'm going to say, if you feel like trying it, try it. And I think. This, the puzzles are one way in which you can take the material from this class and actually make it apply. 
On Wednesday, of course, there's class again, and there will be a follow-up email about the class. On Thursday, there will be an email about your project. You're saying, what project? It's coming, so we'll talk about it. It's already started. You know it yet. Okay? For the next 15 weeks, this project will run through the class. And on Thursday, my job is to nag you. You know why? Because this is a project that you're supposed to be doing week by week as we do in class. But I'm a realist. You will fall behind, and my job is to make you feel guilty. Or at least one person in a group feel guilty enough that they nag the rest of you. So I'm nagger in chief, and I have sub-naggers go after you saying, hey, how come you're not caught up on the project? On Friday, I will put out what I call an in-practice webcast. Like what? In a couple of weeks, we're going to talk about risk-free rates. And I'll talk in class about estimating the risk-free rate in Indonesian rupiah. And I'll take you through the process. But that Friday, I'll talk about if I had to start from scratch, where would I get the information to get a risk-free rate? So essentially taking what we did in class and talking about, hey, if you have to start from scratch, how would you build up to a risk-free rate? And that'll go every week for the next week. On Saturday, you'll get a newsletter with not much news. It'll basically tell you what happened during the week. And here's why. When you're in a class of 250 or 260 or whatever it turns out to be, it's very difficult during the middle of the semester, especially when things get busy, to get lost. You think, where are we in the class? In this class, you will always know, because in the Saturday newsletter, I said, this is the page we are in the lecture notes. This is where you should be in the project, not the nag. And then a very short list of things you could do with that week's material. On Sunday, you get an email saying, this is coming the week ahead. So basically, you can already see you're going to get an email a day. Okay, for the next 15 weeks. Last semester, this was, I think, 121 emails. Some days I sent two emails. Why? Because the first email contained a mistake. I'm teaching three classes. I have no idea what I'm sometimes sending. Sometimes I send the wrong email to the wrong class and say, sorry, not meant for you. Your quiz is not yesterday. Okay. <laughs> so you get about 120 emails, essentially, all through the class to make sure that you're on board. And if you're not, I'm going to drag you back on board. Very short list of what I need for each class. I would like you to be here, but I'm not going to force you. you think, can you imagine how much time we'd waste if I took attendance at the start of every class? The whole class would be taking attendance. Frankly, if you don't want to be here, I don't want you to be here. Okay? I know some of you sleep in really late. And you might 10.30 might be still too early for your wake up time. But if you wake up at 10.40 and say, oh my god, can I go to class? I'd rather have you here late than not at all. Okay. So this is one of the few forums you get to talk to a lot of MBA ones. So I know that do you have elections or something in the middle that you run where you, you know, essentially there are announcements you want to make. So at the start of every class, I'm going to open up the first two minutes for announcements. But given that there are 250 people, I've got to make this a little structured. So there'll be another Google shared spreadsheet that you see on the, the entry page for this class where you can go in and sign up for a specific date. So if you have a club that you want to make an announcement for, if you have any announcement you want to make, the first two minutes, the only rule is it's got to be two minutes. And you can't have a lot of AV stuff going on in the background, because that throws me off, because then I've got to log you out and log me in. So if you have a slide to show, give me the slide so I can put it on my page so it doesn't require logging in and logging out. Did I jump ahead again? Third, for each class, try to bring your lecture note packet. That's the only thing you need. If any of you visited the bookstore, is the packet ready to buy? Anybody know? It, was, it wasn't, definitely wasn't in a couple of weeks ago. If it makes it, the bookstore operates on, I don't know, a 20th century schedule. Okay? I think six people have to sign off on this. You know, it's like a national security document or something. And on top of that, they charge you an absurdly high price for copying 300 pages. You know there's an option, right? You can download the, the entire packet as a PDF file, as a PowerPoint. You can just please don't print it on the printers downstairs, because you know what's going to happen. 250 times 300 is 7,500 pages. You print 7,500 pages, and the printers downstairs, I'm going to hear about it. 
So if you have to print the packet, and you have a part-time job, use the printer at your work. <laughs> they won't even notice. They print all kinds of crap, right? Or slide into a friend's office, put the USB in, print the whole thing off, just no. Or if you prefer to keep it as a digital file, that's fine as well. You can keep it on your iPad, write notes on the side. And I am going to let you, you know, the quizzes and exams are open book, open notes. But I will let you have your iPad open for notes, not for Excel and spreadsheets and stuff. So if you want to keep it in digital format, that's fine as well. If you, if you miss a class, there's no excuse for not catching up because I'll give you multiple ways of watching the class. You can watch it as a stream right from the NYU server. That'll be a link. You can watch it as a YouTube video. I'll make every session into a YouTube video. The advantage of YouTube is it's not constrained by ba bandwidth. So if you have a cell connection in an airport, you can still watch the YouTube video. Okay? You can download the video if you want to just download it and watch it on your own, and then or watch it at, when you exercise instead of Netflix, you know, lecture, corporate finance lecture. It's 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 gripping. Okay? You will feel like exercising even more just to make it go longer. Or you can download as an audio file. Why? I don't know. When you jog, you might want to listen to the lecture. Multiple ways in which you can catch up. So if you have to miss a class, which let's face it, as MBAs, you're going to have interviews. You're going to, it's unrealistic for me to say show up at every class, but I'm going to give you a chance to make sure that you catch up and keep up with the class. Much of the information you need for the class is going to be on that web page that I've emailed you multiple times already. That's the entry page. You're saying, what about NYU classes? What about NYU classes? I don't like closed systems, so I start off with the best of intentions every semester saying I'm going to keep NYU classes updated, but around the third week I say, who the heck cares about NYU classes? So this is, it's, it's open, it, you know, you can op open it, pretty much everything for the class should be in there. For those of you who have Apple devices, I put the class on iTunes U. In fact, you don't even need an Apple device. I think even with an Android device, you can download the app and essentially the whole class will show up. It's, it's a neat platform because everything is in one place. You can see the lectures, the slides, the post-class test, pretty much everything for the class. And as I said, there's a YouTube channel which will have all the classes going on. Incidentally, while you are taking this class, there are about 6,000 people will be taking it unofficially online on YouTube. So just think about the fact that if you don't show up for class, there are people who are actually taking this class for free. You can work out how much it costs you per class. Okay? It's a lot of money. So you know, if you're not going to show up for class, you, why pay the money? Ask for it back. Google Calendar for the class, I've, I've sent this link as well. I don't know whether I sent the right link sometimes because I said three classes, I sometimes send the wrong link. But the link for this class will have the quiz dates, the final exam date. It'll also give you banners for where you should be on the project. Again, more to nag you, saying this is where you should be. No, the only thing I would uh, suggest you read on the outside is I have, as I said, a blog. And basically, I write only about finance. So don't come there expecting social issues or politics. It's just finance. And it's where I put, write whatever. I'm a dabbler now. I don't do research. Whatever I feel interested in, I dabble. And so last week, I dabbled in Tesla. So you can see on Thursday my post in Tesla. I have a valuation of Casper that I'm going to put up sometime this week. So basically, you will see me kind of look at issues. And in fact, in the first two months of the year, I actually take all publicly traded companies whose data is on my website, and I start looking at corporate finance questions, like how much debt does a typical company have? One of the things in corporate finance that I hope you take out of this class is perspective. You know what I mean by perspective? If I tell you a company has no debt, then I ask you, is that usual? Is that uncommon? Most of us don't have a frame of reference because we live normal lives. So what I try to do with the data is show you what a typical debt ratio looks like globally, what it looks like different sectors. So when somebody says the debt ratio for this company is 45%, you can ask, what business is this company? Say, that sounds like a high number, or that sounds like a pretty typical number. So over the, next, over the first two months, I'll be posting on things I've discovered on a corporate finance level, different companies. So you, know, you get it. 
My Twitter, I'm going to sell you on adding your emails to it because I only a singular objective on this. And my Twitter life started in 2013 when my daughter, who's now 23, busted into my small cubicle part of my house and said, hey, Dad, do you have a Twitter account? I said, Kendra, I don't. She said, Dad, you're so old, and then walked out. Pissed me off no end. So I said, how difficult can it be a Twitter account? So I created a Twitter account and never posted anything on it. A year later, she busts into my cubicle section of, my, of the house again and says, Dad, do you know you have 1,000 followers on Twitter? I said, what the hell are they following? <laughs> I don't Twitter, I don't tweet, I don't do it. So I said, if they're following me, I have to give them something to follow. So I started with 1,000 followers, and I think I have 129,000 now. I have a single objective in life now, to have more followers on Twitter than any of my kids, <laughs> to have more friends on Facebook than any of my kids, even though I'm not on Facebook. Look, I have more friends than you. So help me out here. I want to get the 129,000 to 200,000 as soon as possible. And as I've described it, I, my objective is to become I was going to say the Lady Gaga of finance, but could be the Kanye West of finance. That guy has 45 million followers. What the hell are they following? Obscenities? I don't know. No. So try to, you know, if you can add your name, block me afterwards. I really don't care whether you read my tweets. I just want numbers. Okay? <laughs> so if your dog has a Twitter account, let it on. No, I'll, I'll tweet to dogs specifically. So no, help me out here. So now let's talk about the class. You know what this class is misnamed? When I say corporate finance, what comes to mind? What do you think this class is about? Companies, corporations. This class should really be called business finance, and it's really not even finance. This is a class about how to run a business. Those first financial principles that govern how you run a business. This class covers pretty much everything due. If you spend money, you're making a corporate finance decision. And what decision do you make that doesn't involve the spending of money? I don't know what, I haven't done that week, the brainwashing they do the week before you start your first week in the MBA program. What do they call that? No, uh, uh, you know, this is the, oh, going to be the experience of your life. You're going to learn things over the next two years you've never known before. All lies. But about seven years ago, they invited me to be part of that. They haven't invited me back since. <laughs> so maybe there's a reason. They said, can you come in and talk about your corporate finance class? Because a lot of first year MBAs end up taking it. You know? And maybe you can tell them what the class is about. So I came in with a picture. I said, there's my class. There's everything else you're doing in the program. I firmly believe that every other class you take is in service of this class. <laughs> That accounting class is going to give you the raw material to do corporate finance. That strategy class will give you the story slash BS that you can use to justify big corporate finance decisions. The marketing class affects your margins and your value, so we can talk about product, price, place, and promotion, but I'm seeing corporate finance. This is a class that pretty much covers every aspect of business. So this is not a class about how bankers raise money for companies, because that's, when you think about corporate finance and investment bank, that's what it becomes, right? To call that corporate finance is like a podiatrist claiming to be a general practitioner. Corporate finance is much bigger. Every decision you make is a corporate finance decision. So here's what I'd like to start with. I'd like to start by cleansing your minds of a class many of you had to take last semester. It was called the accounting class. You cannot think like an accountant in this class or you're going to be lost. Let me explain. Some of your accountants don't take this personally. Or take it personally, frankly, I don't care. Right? <laughs> but I'm going to give you the objectives for the class and talk about why the accounting mindset cannot be the mindset you bring into corporate finance. So I'm going to start my three objectives for this class. And in the last session of this class, I'm going to bring these up and ask you, did we get anywhere close to these objectives? The first objective in this class is to make it applied. I taught this class for the first time in 1986 at Stern and 1984 at UC Berkeley. And the first time I taught it, I do what first-time instructors do, which is 
to pull a syllabus that somebody else had used and started teaching it. And as I went through the syllabus, I said, who the heck cares about working capital management, optimal inventory? This is like 19th century, forget even 20th century. So one of the things I started doing is I started going through say, can I apply this? And the answer is no, I started drawing lines through it. So if it cannot be applied, we're not going to talk about it. So if I bring up something, it's my obligation to show you how it's applied. You can say, why do you waste my time? So there'll be no theories for the sake of theories, models for the sake of models. Everything we do will be applied. And I'm going to make it more concrete in a few minutes. Second, this is a big picture class. Doesn't mean we won't get lost in details, right? So when we get to risk free rates, we're going to spend time talking about risk free rates. When we get to risk premiums, we'll talk about risk premiums. And sometimes you're going to get lost in the details because you're so caught up in, I didn't get that equity risk premium. I'm really stuck. And my job is to elevate you and say, this is the big picture. This is where it fits. And if you don't get it, you can come back and revisit it. But this is a class where I'm constantly going to push you back from the details saying, let's look at the big picture. And third, and this is going to sound a little sick, I think corporate finance is fun. And I really mean it. It's like fun in the, in the sense a crossword puzzle is fun. When the pieces all come together, it's mind blowing. And my job is to try to give you the pieces. I can't bring them together for you. But if they come together for you, you get this moment of, hey, I get it. I see why companies buy back stock. I see what types of companies should be paying dividends. That's the end game in this class is to give you that. No, I want you to be able to read the Wall Street Journal actively. You know what that means? You read a news story and you say, OK, let's see. Does that make sense? It'll change the way you think about business news. And you're going to discover very quickly that companies do a lot of stupid things. They have covers. McKinsey asked me to do it. Goldman asked me to do it. Hey, just because McKinsey and Goldman asked you to jump off a bridge doesn't mean jumping off the bridge was a good idea. You paid them to give you the advice. They gave you the advice. So we're going to see that some of things companies do doesn't make sense. Some of the things experts claim companies should do doesn't make sense either. So in the, in the end of the last class, and this is going to be the toughest objective for me to deliver, I'm going to ask you, is it fun? In fact, I'm going to keep asking that question. Are we having fun yet? But I'll tell you something. For the next 15 weeks, I'm going to have fun. <laughs> What's the point of teaching if you're not? You, can, you have two choices. You can either watch me have fun and get pissed off, or you can join in. It's so much easier to join in. So let's have some fun, because this is not rocket science. This is not some deep stuff. This is basic common sense. So let's start with that accounting mindset versus a financial mindset. How many of you had to take accounting last semester? OK. To me, to capture how accountants think about the world, how many of you are actually accountants? OK. Maybe you should, guys should sit right in front so I can pick on you right away, right? To me, the, the financial statement that best captures the accounting mindset is the accounting balance sheet. You've all seen this, right? You open up an annual report, there's a balance sheet. Let me take you through an accounting balance sheet, and you're already going to see some of the reasons why it's not going to work in corporate finance. So let's look at the assets out of the balance sheet. You have land, building, equipment, machinery. It's classified as a fixed asset. And if you have fixed assets in accounting statements, how are they recorded in the balance sheet? I'm sorry, what? On the cost basis. If you bought equipment in 1975, they show the cost you paid. And then what else do they do? They show you how much, in theory, that asset is depreciated over time. So basically, it's recorded at original cost, net of depletion that accountants claim have happened it's called depreciation. So that's fixed assets. Then you have current assets. What's in there? Cash, inventory, accounts receivable. These are recorded at cost as well, but because they've not been around that long, you don't have inventory that's been sitting for 25 years as a business, I hope, unless they do some stupid FIFO, LIFO crap on it. Current assets usually reflect what you paid for those assets. It's pretty much, it's much closer to what's on there. Then you got investments in other companies, and God help us, because how it's recorded depends on why you hold it. 
So if you hold it for trading, like banks do, it's mark to market, which means whatever the price is, you record it. So if you're a private equity investor, you're a hedge fund, it's mark to market. You say, this is good. You know how much trouble SoftBank has been going through in the last six months, trying to mark to market what WeWork is worth? They started by marking it to 47 billion. Why? Because that was the price. Who paid that price? SoftBank. This is a very self-fulfilling prophecy. <laughs> we paid 47 billion. It must be worth four. It's like being on eBay on an auction and you keep bidding up the price. Say, look, the price is going up. Of course it's going up. You're bidding against yourself. They recorded it 47 billion in June of 2019. And then of course, there was that infamous IPO. Infamous because you had two gigantic egos driving a company off a cliff. One was Masasan. Anybody who makes 300 year plants needs to have either their head examined or their ego examined. And the other, of course, is Adam Newman. And I'm not even sure how to describe him. An overgrown child. <laughs> they drove it off the cliff. They expected to get 65 billion. That was the Goldman Sachs. IPO pricing, which tells you what? Don't trust what investment banks put as a price. A pricing game, they thought they could get 65 billion. And the whole thing imploded. And the end game was SoftBank ended up buying back control of WeWork at an $8 billion pricing. Notice, don't use the word valuation with either 47 or 8 billion. That's just pricing. So in November, when they had to do, redo the financials, they faced a problem which is you mark to market, which means you mark from 47 to 8 billion, you're going to have to show a loss. And then of course they did a little dance saying it was a mistake, it was a big mistake, we'll never make this mistake again. And I'm just waiting for the OYO and the, uh, the other games to play through. But it's mark to market. But if you hold it as a strategic investment, it's not mark to market. It's marked to whatever you paid originally to get that investment, and perhaps the retained earnings since, which probably is, close, is either negative if you have a money losing company, or very small if you have a young growth company. To show you how disconnected this can get from reality, about five years ago, or six years ago, I was valuing Yahoo. Yahoo was a walking dead company by the time I was valuing it. Why? How much would you value a search engine that nobody searches on with an email program that nobody uses? The answer is very low. So I bent over backwards. I came up with a value of about five billion for Yahoo. It's an operating asset. It's a search engine. They were trading at 39 billion. You're saying, this is terrible. The market's making a terrible mistake. It wasn't. In fact, Yahoo's value didn't come from the search engine. It came from two investments they'd made over their history. You know what the two investments were? One was 21% of Alibaba. They, they bought for $1 billion in 2000 and something. And that $1 billion in 2014, when Alibaba went public, 21% of $200 billion, which is where they went public, at is $42 billion. If you looked at Yahoo's balance sheet, what would you have seen? $1 billion. Alibaba investment. You can already see that when you look at an accounting balance sheet, when you look at financial investments, God only knows what that number is, unless you know the motives, unless you know what's happening, and even then you're not quite sure. And then you come to intangible assets. Accountants have this fixation. Is it physical? Is it intangible? Who the heck cares? But they're this intangible assets. We need new rules to cover intangible assets. So let's start with basics. Are there companies out there that get the bulk of their value from intangible assets? In fact, look at the 10 largest market cap companies in the world. Amazon, Google, Facebook, Apple. I mean, these are companies where your biggest asset is not physical assets, it's intangible. It's true, right? So this is good. Accountants are coming to their senses. But if you look across the world at accounting balance sheets, 85% of the intangible assets and accounting balance sheets come from one item. What is that item? Goodwill. The worst most destructive accounting item ever created. And let me explain why. For goodwill to manifest itself on an accounting balance sheet, what does a company have to do? 
acquire another company. So if you're the greatest company on the face of the earth and you've never done an acquisition, there can be no goodwill on your balance sheet. Take a look at Apple's balance sheet. It has very little goodwill. Could it bought Beats, but you have $250 billion in cash. Buying a $6 billion company, that's like petty cash. Go buy the company, bring it back to me. Right? <laughs> If they'd bought Tesla, the answer would have been very different, right? But the minute you do an acquisition, accountants wake up and good will manifest itself. So somebody help me out. When you do an acquisition, what does good will measure? It's obviously the difference between two numbers. What are the two numbers that are being compared for good will to be measured? Okay. So I'm glad you did not use words like fair value or all that stuff that's been thrown in. Because it's really the difference between what you paid and adjusted book value. You think, what adjusted book value? Right after you do an acquisition, a group of accountants show up from Deloitte or ENY, and they do a dance called the impairment dance. Which is they, they dance around, basically, they, they reassess your stuff. They say, the four billion is really worth 4.05 billion. They'll have a, you know, all kinds of models reflected. But the reality is, it's book value plus. Dressing up book value is like dressing up a turkey. It's really tough to cover that scrawny neck, no matter how well you tailor the clothes. So here's what happens. You pay, pay 10 billion for a company, the book value is 4 billion. The accountant has a $6 billion problem to explain away. Why? Because until yesterday, what is the accountant saying? The company's worth $4 billion. The comp Remember, the accounting fiction is book value actually measures the value of your company, and this reveals how much it's fiction. So what do they do? They take the $6 billion, they call it goodwill, they put it on your balance sheet, and they have to do it. Why? Because balance sheets have a very unpleasant requirement, which is they have to balance Goodwill exists for one reason and one reason alone. It's a plug variable that makes balance sheets balance. And you know how much pain this creates for me when I do valuation? I mean, I get emails from people saying, I'm valuing this company. I'm almost done with this valuation, but it has six billion in goodwill. How much should I pay for it? Because it sounds good. To which my answer is, it's a plug variable. What the heck are you thinking of paying for it? Every year I send these suggestions to the Accounting Standards Board. His <laughs> eminent never seemed to take it. So about eight years ago, I sent a suggestion that we rename Goodwill. In algebra, if you have two numbers that don't equate, and you want to write an equation that makes them equate, what do you do? You say 2 plus x is whatever. I said, let's call Goodwill x. Wouldn't it be a much more honest description of what that 6 billion is? There's nothing behind it. So already you can see in an accounting balance sheet, when you look at the assets, different rules apply for different assets, depending on whether they're physical assets or, car I mean, fixed assets or current assets or financial assets or intangibles. And on the other side of the balance sheet, you see the mirror image of all of those accounting rules that show up on the asset side. First, you have debt. And as with assets, the debt records what you originally borrowed at. And now, of course, there are some places where they mark debt to market as well, but that's uncommon. And then you look at shareholders' equity. Sounds fancy. You open up Coca-Cola. You open up the balance sheet. The shareholders' equity, a number. What does that measure? Or what does that reflect? It reflects the company's entire history is in there, right? That IPO they did when 100 years ago is in there, plus or minus. If I were to write out the book value of equity for a company, it's a summation of all your retained earnings across time, which could be 100 years, plus your original IPO. It is the ultimate backward-looking number. So here's the accounting mindset. Whether they like it or not, it's a historical mindset. It's recording history. There's nothing bad about this, as long as you admit this is your job, reflecting history. And second, it's driven by rules. Accountants treat the world like it's full of six-year-olds. 
If you don't believe me, pick up GAP or IFRS. Don't do this, don't do this, don't even think about doing this. It's rule after rule after rule of what you can or cannot do. Accounting is backward looking and rule driven. So let's switch mindsets. From this point on, I don't want you to forget your accounting because unfortunately you still need to go to accounting statements to get your raw data. But I want you to think like a finance person. When I look at a company, here's what I see. I don't see fixed assets and intangible assets. And I see assets is broken down to assets in place, investments you've already made as a company, and growth assets. Assets in place are pretty simple. I'm asking you, what have you invested in? What are your products? What are your services? I put that as assets in place. And I ask you, what are your plans for the future? You know what growth assets are? It's the value that I'm attaching to investments I expect you to make next year, two years out, five years out, 10 years out, 50 years out. You're saying that's speculative. Everything is speculative. Because you're looking at the future, this notion that just because you're going to make an estimate, you've got to stop. If you think like that, you're already done in corporate finance. It's always about the future. One of the things I'm going to talk about is a corporate life cycle. And I'm going to look at this breakdown of assets in place and growth assets as one way of thinking about where in the life cycle your company is. In fact, I'll give you a preview. I'm going to talk about Casper, and I'm going to talk about GE. G is too depressing. Let's pick something even more depressing. How about J.C. Penny? That'll be a nice one. Okay. When you think about assets in place and growth assets, where's the bulk of Casper's value coming from? Come on, this is an easy one. It's going to be value. It's going to be priced at about 800 million, according to the bankers. Let's say it go, goes at 800 million. How much of the 800 million are you paying for things that they've already done? What have they already done? Put up ads in the subway. That's pretty much it. They don't make their own mattresses. Their mattresses are no different than the Lisa mattress or any of the other four. They have an undifferentiated product that they've outsourced. But they have plans. They have potential. They hope to bring the manufacturing in. They hope to be a sleep company. Don't laugh because that's pretty much how every company describes itself. We are, Uber described themselves as a personal mobility company. What the hell does that even mean? I think I get it now. My son, my youngest son, is so used to Uber that sometimes on Saturday nights I see this $3 Uber charge. I think he's calling Uber and a person is coming into the apartment carrying him from the bed to the toilet and back again saying, <laughs> personal mobility accomplished, that'll be $3. Casper has potential. We don't disagree on that. But the bulk of its value comes from the future. Doesn't make it good or bad. It's just a young company. Whereas with JCPenney, how much value comes from the future? How many, plan, how, how many new stores do you plan to open in the next 10 years? Your best case scenario is you die slowly, <laughs> not quickly. This is like a horror story. You're going down to the basement. Nothing good is going to come out of there. But the, all of your value comes from assets in place. There is no growth value. So as you look across companies, where the value comes from tells you a little bit about where in the life cycle they fall. And on the other side of the balance sheet, you have debt and equity. There are only two ways you can fund a business. You can borrow the money or use your own money. Equity doesn't mean you've got to issue shares. If you, have, if you have a small private company you've started, it might be sweat equity. It might be the equity you invest, but equity and debt. It's a much simpler perspective. At the same time, it's much more complicated because you've got to think about the future. You can't just look at the facts on cash. Let me look at the financial statements. You're going to find nothing there because everything that's going to happen in this company is going to happen in the future. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to lay out the big picture. I know every class they talk about the big picture, but I really mean it. This is the big picture of corporate finance. Everything in this class is here. And I'll make a confession. If at the end of this class, this is the only page you remember, my mission has been accomplished. So let me list out corporate finance in one page. The objective in corporate finance when you run a business a for-profit business, let me be specific, is to maximize the value of that business. 
Notice I didn't say maximize the stock price. We'll have to do a little dance as to whether stock price and value are the same thing. Maximize the value of the business. And there are three big principles that govern corporate finance. The first is what I call the investment principle. And here's what the investment principle says. If you go out and make investments as a company, make sure those investments earn a return that is greater than some minimum acceptable hurdle rate. I've thrown some buzzwords in there. You're saying, what the hell is a minimum acceptable hurdle rate? I'm not ready to give you specifics. That's why this class lasts 15 weeks. <laughs> but I can give you the sub-principle that's going to govern what that minimum acceptable hurdle rate should be. It should be higher for riskier investments and lower for safer investments. That makes sense to you? And it should reflect where you get your funding, whether you use debt and equity. So the hurdle rate should reflect the risk of your investments and the mix of debt and equity used to fund them. And when we talk about returns, we're not talking about accounting returns. We're talking about cash in, cash flow. Our returns are based on cash flows. Why? Because you cannot spend earnings. Try. Walk into a Starbucks and look, I'm you know, going for an MBA. I have lots of future earnings. Can I pay $5 in earnings? Doesn't work. It's based on cash flows. Should reflect when you get those cash flows. Would you rather get the cash flow? So if I offered you, would you rather get a million now or a million a year from now? What's the answer? Don't think too long. Rather, and this is, a, and I could draw an indifference curve and all that neat stuff. It should reflect when you get those cash flows and should have all side effects incorporated in it. There's no garnishing allowed in investment analysis. You know what I mean by garnishing? If any of you worked at companies, you work on all these numbers and the numbers deliver a verdict. And the verdict is not good. And your CEO says, but there are strategic reasons for taking this. You know what that means. You get a pathway to hell on your own because it was called strategic. There's synergy. In other words, there's words you throw in after the fact. That's garnishing. If you want to talk about strategic, let's get specific. Tell me what's strategic, I'll bring it to the numbers. You want to talk about synergy, tell me what synergies and I'll bring it to the numbers. Because otherwise there's no point to investment analysis. You already made up your mind. So investment principle says go out and take investments that make a return greater than your hurdle rate. The second principle is the financing principle. I said there were two ways you could raise money. You could borrow the money or use your own money. Again, we can go into the trade-offs and all the mechanics, but here's the bottom line. You want to find a mix of debt and equity that minimizes your hurdle rate. Why is that good? A lower hurdle rate means you can take more projects. So if I can find a mix that minimizes your hurdle rate for you, that is your right mix of debt and equity and will not be the same for every company. And if you ask me what kind of debt should I take, long term or short term, dollar or euro, I'm going to turn the question back on you and say, tell me what kind of investments you make, and I'll tell you what kind of debt is right for you. You take a lot of long term projects in mainland Europe. You know what? Your debt should be long term, and the currency should be euros, unless it happens to be in Switzerland. So that's a problem in mainland Europe, you've got to take all of those out. Basically, you tell me what currency your projects are in. It's simple. You think, can't be that simple. It is. Match your debt up to your assets. And finally, there's a dividend principle. For some reason, people seem to view the payment of dividends or buying back stock, which triggers all kinds of things in people, as a weakness. Why do farmers plant crops? Help me out here, play along. You're not a farmer saying, how the hell do I know what they I go to go, uh, Whole Foods, I buy the crops. I have no idea where they came from. They come in bags already. <laughs> you plant crop because you want to harvest. Why do you invest money in a company? Because you like the look of the company. No, you invest in companies because you want to harvest the cash flows. You know what dividends and cash? They're the admission the company actually worked. The kind of company you don't want to invest in is a company that never is able to pay dividends and buy back. Why it keeps losing money forever. The dividend principle says that if you cannot find investments that make your hurdle rate, don't fight it. You're old. Give the cash back to the owners of the business. If it's a private business, you take it out. It's a public company. The shareholders get it, either as dividends and buybacks, and we'll talk about why one versus the other. And it doesn't disappear into a black hole. This is what I don't understand about the buybacks argument. Last year, there were $800 billion 
in buybacks at US companies. So that's such a waste. Those companies should have invested the money. Do you really want G investing your money? Do you want JC Penny investing your money? In what? That 800 billion went into the pockets of shareholders, and what do they do with it? They invest in Uber, they invest in Lyft. You might not like where the money goes, but the money doesn't go into a black hole, it gets reinvested elsewhere. The question should be, shouldn't I do buybacks or should we invest? It's who should be investing that money? And one of the questions we're going to talk about is when does it make sense to do buybacks, when doesn't it? And it's a very simple rule. If you cannot find investments that make your hurdle rate, why? Because your business has been disrupted, it's changed. Give the cash back. And whether you do it in dividends or buybacks depends on what your stockholders like. You see, in some companies, what they like is dividends. You know why? Because you have a history of paying dividends. You get the stockholders you deserve. You have a history of paying big dividends. They prefer to get dividends. But if you're Google, remember your stockholders have never got dividends. If you pay them dividends, they're going to get pissed off. Why? April 15th is coming. A lot of companies are going to piss me off this year. Because they paid me a dividend, I didn't need the cash, but now I have to pay taxes. You're saying taxes is something I have to pay? I, I know, but I'd like to control when I pay taxes, and you get that with buyback, because if you don't sell your shares back, here's what you get instead. Instead of the dividend, you get a price appreciation. You can choose to hold it, you can choose not to hold it. So we'll come back and debate this question, but the principle is a simple one. If you cannot find investments, give the cash back. So I'm going to lay out five broad themes for this class, and they're going to animate everything we do. The first I've kind of listed out already. If you look at what I said on that first page, what did I say? If it costs you 9% to raise money, please, please don't take investments that make less than 9%. Is this mind-blowing for you? I mean, this sounds like common sense, right? And if I told you that you can raise money at 9% or 10%, which would you rather do? So I'll raise it at 9%. And if you cannot make investments that earn 9%, then you're going to take the cash back. There's corporate finance in a nutshell. And why should that surprise us? You know how old, <clears throat> how old corporate finance is as a discipline? It's 62 years old. You know how we can date it? Because until 1958, there was no corporate finance. It was just a glorified accounting class. Thank God it's not 1955. Yeah. 1958, two professors at the University of Chicago, Merton Miller and Franco Modigliani, wrote a paper. That paper, which we'll talk about during the course of this class, gave birth to corporate finance. So corporate finance has been around for 62 years. How long have people been running businesses? I'm sure there were some very good cave business people. Fire, new invention, come on in. Okay? Good business people through the ages have always understood these first principles. That's why you can build an incredible business without, forget about an MBA without a college degree. In fact, one of India's biggest businesses, Reliance, was created by a man, Dhirubhai Ambani, who had a fifth grade education. But he got the first principles. If you get those first principles, everything else is icing on the cake. You cut to the chase. So people can't do dances around you because you always go back to the core question, does this make sense? And that's what I want you to go back to, is when you see a lot of stuff thrown at you, complex models, step back and say, does this make sense? And that includes anything I say. So during the course of this class, if something I say doesn't make sense, let's nail it down. Let's make sure that you get the two working together, because otherwise you're just learning things, because that's what you're supposed to learn. Second, corporate finance is focus. You know the focus comes from? What did I say the objective was in corporate finance? maximize the value of the business. In fact, we're going to talk about how this often gets narrowed down to maximize the stock price. But the advantage of having a focus is whenever you ask me, should I do this, I can answer it because I have a focus. You say, should I do an acquisition? What do I measure? If I do the acquisition, will the value of my firm go up or down? That's it. You can tell me all the stories you want, but it doesn't matter. It gives me focus, but it comes at a cost. You know what the cost is? If you don't like this objective or you don't believe in it, nothing we say in this class is going to make sense to you. So you know what we're going to do? For the first two, perhaps three sessions after this one, I'm going to spend time 
talking about the weakest links in the corporate finance objective. You're saying, why the weakest link? Why don't you make your strongest case? Because I want to inoculate you against all those other classes you're going to go to where they're going to say, oh, these finance guys, they talk about man. I will take every weakness and I will lay it bare. And then we'll talk about the alternatives. Maximize take, stakeholder wealth, maximize this, do that. And we'll talk about why I return back to this objective. Because I think that's important. Because philosophically, that's where corporate finance comes from. And if you don't get that objective, everything is going to start to get a little less believable. Third, as I said, there's a life cycle focus. And you're going to see this picture show up in different formats as we go through the class. So when I look at companies, I see them going through a life cycle, just like human beings do. You have a startup. A startup is like a baby slash toddler. What do they do? They fall a lot. I was with my two-year-old grandson over the weekend. That kid falls like crazy. It's all, but he just gets up and he keeps going. Startups have all kinds of things that are going to make them fall over. So you've got the toddler stage. Then you've got what I call young growth. You're becoming a kid, perhaps a teenager. File that away. And then you get to the peak of your life. You know what that is? You can go to bed at 3, wake up at 6, and be a well-functioning human being. You can try that at 25. Don't do that at 45. It's not going to work. But at 25, everything you do you know, seems to work out. That's young growth. And then you start to discover that you're starting to get a little older. Mature growth. But don't get too upset about it, because there are worse things coming down the pike. After mature growth, you get middle-aged, boring. You're financially settled. Enjoy your middle age, because after middle age comes old age. And then you die. <laughs> this is the human life cycle, right? And what do human beings do all through the life cycle? They fight it. There's an entire ecosystem of people who tell you you can be young again. Like what? Plastic surgeons, your physical trainer, you can be young again. It's all a lie. You see that at the Oscars, right? People whose faces are frozen. You can't even see what they're saying or doing. But this is human nature. Nobody wants to grow old. File that away. Because companies go through the same process. Let's give each one an A. Let's say startup slash young growth. You guys are going to be Casper. So, in fact, we're going to do the entire corporate finance decision making based on the company. So you're going to be Casper. Let's pick a teenage company. I'll pick my corporate teenager one who made me a lot of money over the last seven months. You guys be Tesla. What do teenagers do? Every morning they wake up, they have lots of potential, and they say, what can I do today to screw it all up? <laughs> that kind of captures Tesla in a nutshell, right? <laughs> okay. So you got Tesla. Then you got young growth. This is a fun place to be. Who should we put in young growth? How about Netflix? Netflix, OK, so you pass your teenage years, but you still have teenage impulses sometimes. Then you get to mature growth. How about Google, Facebook, Apple? And now we get to the depressing part. I'm sorry to do this to you guys. But you're in mature stable. Kraft Heinz, Coca-Cola, Levi Strauss. Your best days are behind you. There's nothing to debate. And then you get to the walking dead. You could put pretty much any brick and mortar retail company in here. So when Bed Bath & Beyond got a new CEO and everybody got all excited, you can't make a walking dead company back into a young company. I don't care who runs a company, but you're a walking dead company. You're saying, how does this help me in corporate finance? What are the three big decisions in corporate finance? The investment, the financing, and the dividend. You haven't taken the class. You already can tell me the answers. If you're Casper, which of these three decisions are you going to focus your attention on? Are you going to worry about how much debt should I take on? What's wrong with you? What, how can you borrow money? You're losing money already. How much should you pay in dividends? There's no dividends. All it matters is that you get growth, which means your entire focus is going to be an investment decision. You can even skip having a finance department. What the heck are they going to do anyway? It's all about investing all the time. And if you do it well, you're going to be worth a lot. And you do it badly, you're going to crash and burn. You get to Tesla. You've made that transition. 
It's still about the investment decision. Why? Because you want to sell 3 million cars. You better have the assembly plans to do it. The Shanghai plant was a good step forward. But right now, the capacity is about 500 to 600,000 cars. So even if you're a Tesla optimist, there's a lot of work left to be done. So it's the investment decision. And if you think about how much Tesla should borrow, the answer is pretty obvious. How much money did Tesla make last year with all the good stuff they reported in the last earnings report? They actually lost money. They had operating income that was, in theory, positive. It was all negative. So if you are advising Tesla on how much they should borrow, remember, you don't pay debt with promise and potential. You have to pay debt with cash. So Tesla should really have no debt. What do they really have? They have $11 billion in debt. Talk about teenagers doing stupid things. This, you put a company with incredible promise at risk. Why? Because you told, you tweeted out to your investors that you're going to be cash flow positive. There's a consequence here. And this is what worries me about Tesla is you always have these decisions driven by impulses up front. You say, that made no sense. When Tesla borrowed money in 2016, Europa said, this makes no sense to me that a money losing company with lots of potential you say, what are the choices they have? What are the choices they have? Your stock's trading at 640. Just raise the damn equity. You think people will be upset that I have to raise equity? No, they will say, you are being realistic. You need to grow. You need to raise equity. So Tesla, it's predominantly investment decision, but because they borrowed money, they've created a potential problem for themselves. So every time their stock price drops, I can predict all the clamor is going to, will they go bankrupt? Will they be able to make? Completely unforced error, but that's Tesla. Let's move further up the life cycle as you go to Netflix. The investment decision clearly still matters, but the financing decision starts to come into play. They're finally getting to make money. They're still cash flow negative. Why? How much money did Netflix spend on entertainment, on, on making uh, content last year? $15 billion. More than any other entertainment company in the world. They make Disney look like a slacker. And there's a reason for that. They're making content in seven different languages and 15 different countries. They're destroying the entertainment business, if you ask me, from, because of the amount of money they're throwing. But you have, they have to start thinking about financing. Dividends are still down the road. But as you grow more mature, you see the focus shift away from the investment decision. And then you get to companies like Kraft, Times, or Coca-Cola. There's really no time spent on the investment decision. There shouldn't be. It really is going to be about how do we finesse our capital structure to lower our cost of capital. But if your focus is entirely on lowering your cost of capital, remember, you're well past your best days. Because think about great companies. Great companies don't make money by lowering the cost of capital from 11% to 10%. Great companies create value by making 35% returns. You think, why can't I keep making 35% returns? Because your side starts working into your competition, comes into 35, becomes 30, 25, 20. And when it gets to 15, what do you start thinking about? Hey, can I lower my cost of capital? It's a signal that your best days are behind you. And if you're JC Penny, there's no investment decision to think about. Your financing decision, how quickly can I pay down my debt? And your dividend decision, how quickly can I liquidate myself? The focus shifts as you move from young growth down to declining slash walking dead companies. So as we go through this class, when we pick a company, I'd like you to think, where in the life cycle is that company? Because you can almost predict what you're going to see for that company. Corporate finance is universal. I've never understood classes on emerging market corporate finance, global corporate finance. Corporate finance is corporate finance. I mean, look at those principles. Are there principles that apply just to US publicly traded companies, that you have to make more than your hurdle rate? They apply to private businesses and public companies, emerging market companies and developed market companies. They might, not, they might even apply not to companies, but to any kind of enterprise you create as objectives to make profits. So we're going to see that the principles apply across the board. And I'm going to try to show the universality. And I'm going to be open about the fact that the challenges you face might be different for different companies. So an emerging market company, you might struggle more to get basic information, get a risk-free rate. But that doesn't make the principles change. 
And finally, if you violate those first principles, I don't care who you are or what you do, somebody's going, to have a, somebody's going to pay a price. It might not be you. You might have walked away, but somebody's going to pay a price. And here's, I think, one of the big tragedies, if you can call it this, in corporate finance. The people who think they can violate corporate finance first principles tend to live in New York and Tokyo and Frankfurt and London. They tend to work at big investment banks. They tend to have MBAs from Harvard, Wharton, Stern. You know, they, say, you know, the, they say, the rules don't apply to me. And you say, look, really? Let me give you a story to bring home how the rules apply to all of us. You heard of a company called Steady Safe? There's a reason you haven't heard of the company. It's a company that used to operate taxi cabs in Jakarta in the early 1990s. And Steady Safe, and Indonesia was growing at 10 double digit rates then, and Steady Safe wanted to grow. And they wanted to raise money to find more taxi cabs to put on the ground so they could grow. So you're going to be my banker, and I'm going to be Steady Safe, and I'm going to come to you for some advice on. What kind of debt should I take? You're saying we haven't taken, you already know the answer because we've kind of talked about what kind of debt should we take. I come to you and say, look, I want to borrow $50 million. or oh, 50 million, let's take the dollars out. 50 million to, uh, and buy 500 cars. First, how long term should the debt be? You're allowed to ask me back questions. How long do my cars last? I run them into the ground, about 10 years. So the debt should be? Ten years. What currency should the debt be in? You're saying, what the heck is the Indonesian currency? Let me help you out. It's a rupiah. Why should it be in rupiah? Because you run taxi cabs in Jakarta. People get out. They don't pay out in dollars or euros. They pay in rupiah. So it should be low, no ten-year rupiah debt. This was easy, right? So let's play out what actually happened. Steady Safe went to an investment bank. I won't, it's, it was called Peregrine. It's not the same Peregrine that's out there. It used to be a big Asian investment bank. And they asked them the question, what debt should we take? And Peregrine says, you should take 10-year debt. They've got half the equation right. But you should borrow in US dollars. And they gave what sounded like a really good reason. What is the rationale they gave? It's cheaper. You see how it's cheaper? The interest rate on dollar debt was much lower than the, Indonesia, in the, the interest rate on in rupiah debt. So it's cheaper. We'll see how absurd that statement is in a, in a week when we talk about risk free rates in different currencies. It's cheaper. And Steady Safe, to give them credit, said, Should we be worried about the fact that we're, we're running a business in rupee and you're asking us to borrow in dollars? And Peregrine said, Don't worry about it. The government has pegged the exchange rate and promised us that nothing bad will happen. Steady Safe said, you're the investment bank. You must know all this stuff. They went out and borrowed 100 million US dollars, bought a lot of cars, put them on the road. Things went swimmingly well for a couple of years until you get to 1996. And the government that had promised that nothing bad would happen did what? They devalued the rupiah by 70%. Let's look at the morning after. You're Steady Safe. You look at the balance sheet. Your assets are all rupee assets, right? In dollar terms, they were 30% of what they were yesterday. If your debt had also been rupee debt, that would have been marked down. You you'd have, wouldn't have been happy about what happened, but you wouldn't have been in trouble. But in this case, your assets get marked down 70%. Your debt stays at $100 million. Guess what happened to Steady Safe? They went bankrupt. The only good news was they took their investment banker down with them. If you ask me, it happens far too infrequently. Investment bankers are always there at the wedding. I was going to say they're never there at the divorce, but a different team will come and handle your divorce as well. They're always there at the event, collecting the proceeds. They never seem to have to deal with the consequences. Sometimes you see people doing really, or say, or do really stupid things, and they back it up with data. I am very skeptical of this big data move. Because I've played with data, but the, I know data, you can make data sing whatever tune you want it to if you have a tune already in mind. But when people say absurd things like, you know what? Companies don't have to make money, they just have to collect users. I heard this on MoviePass. My reaction was, really? 
Because when I looked at that company, I said, who creates an insane business model where you charge $9.99 per month and allow people to go to a movie a day and then you pick up the cost at the movie theater? Do you know what the average cost of a movie ticket in the U.S. is? $9.24 for one movie. If I go to 30 movies, it's going to cost, it really costs them 200 cents because they actually pick up the, said, who creates a, so I kept looking for a rationale and finally the CEO of MoviePass. Anybody who ever invested or managed this company should be barred from being part of any business from this point on. He gets on CNBC and he says, oh, we have a great business model. And I'm ready to think about what is he going to say. He said, the average American goes to only six movies a year. Okay, fill in the rest now. We're charging $9.99. We're making money of the average American. This guy should go to an insurance company and talk about selection bias. <laughs> the average American is not buying movie pass. It's people like my son who go to a movie every day, who buy movie pass. The company that owned movie pass finally went bankrupt last week. And my response was, what took you guys so damn long? Horrific business model, but there were VCs who funded it, there were bankers who went along for the ride, all claiming that this was okay. You know how investment banks run these tombstone ads? You know the tombstone ads, are, look how great we are, big deal, big deal, bigger deal, huge deal, huge deal. You know, basically a page of deals they've done. And they have deal tables, look, we're at the top of the table. I've considered raising money and running ads for investment banks. You're saying, why do you want to do that? They have enough money to do it? my ads will look a little different. So here's what the ad will look like for Morgan Stanley. I'm not picking on Morgan Stanley specifically to be any investment bank. First ad was, advisor to Quaker Oats on the acquisition of Snapple in 1992 for $4 billion. It's a true deal. Right next to it, just to be cruel, will be a second tombstone. Advisor to Quaker Oats on the divestiture of Snapple in 1996 <laughs> for $900 million. You don't need to do any IRR calculations. No, if you spend $4 billion in 92, get back $900 million in 96. It was not a good deal. But the scary thing was, Morgan Stanley got advisory fees on both ends of this deal. For what? <laughs> you could have gone to the doorman of your building and said, what should I pay for Snapple? He said, it takes us away. He said, oh, this tastes really good. How about three, four billion, something like that. So when you look at big time disasters unfold, you can see it happen in real time sometimes because you can see it doesn't make sense. But there's enough of an ecosystem, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, don't ask questions. Ask questions. Don't let people intimidate you with models and data because when something doesn't make sense, it doesn't make sense. And the obligation of somebody who says, you have to believe this is they have to tell me why it makes sense rather than my telling them why it doesn't make sense. In terms of material for this class, lecture notes are the only thing that are required. If you want to buy a textbook, there is this absurdly overpriced book of mine. A book that was so overpriced, I'm not kidding, right after I, the book got published, they sent me 20 copies saying, you get a 20% author discount. <laughs> it's okay. That's a good deal. So I said 20%, so it must be like 20 bucks. It's a paperback book. What can it be, $40, $50? It's $160. I sent it back. I said, you guys keep it. I'm not paying $160 for a paperback. But I could go off on a rant on publishing here, but I'm, I'll save that for later in the class. You know? So if you feel the urge to spend money, the book is there. Right? I've done my duty to my publisher. I've told you there is a book. I haven't told you much more than that. Okay. <laughs> Incidentally, the, the book parallels the class. The class parallels the book because pretty much they're, they're, this is the fourth edition of this book. The same things go through. You can get pra every, problems and, and examples for every part of the class on the web page that I showed you for the class. And data and spreadsheets, you find them as you go along. In terms of the syllabus, the best way of showing you the syllabus is for the next three sessions, we're going to talk about the objective in corporate finance. Why maximize the value of the firm? Why not market share? Why not revenues? Why not users? Why not subscribers? Then we're going to turn to the investment decision, spend about eight sessions talking about the hurdle rate. How do we measure risk? How do we bring it into a hurdle rate? How do we bring the mix of debt and equity into it? 
And then we're going to spend about three sessions talking about how do we measure returns. How do we come up with cash flows? How do we factor in when the cash flows come in and the side effects? The next five sessions will be about the financing decision. First, about what's the right mix of debt and equity, and the second, what's the right kind of debt. And the dividend decision will come towards the end, where we'll talk about how much can a company return and what form. And then we'll circle back, and I'll end this class with, with the front end of my next class, which is valuation. If my objective is to maximize the value, I have to tie everything we do to value. So in the last two sessions, we'll tie it back to value. And you can decide whether you want more, the structure to continue because there's a valuation class which takes off from that framework. I told you this class would be applied. Let me talk about what I mean by applied. Everything I do in this class, I'm going to apply on real companies. And I'm going to use six companies to illustrate this process. The first company, the one that I'm going to use all the way through most, most of the time, is Disney. You know why I picked Disney? Everybody knows what Disney is. There's a reason I wore my Mickey sweatshirt today. <laughs> Everybody knows. If I took, picked Alcoa, we'd spend half the class, what the heck does Alcoa do? Disney, we kind of know. You're going to be surprised at what you don't know about Disney. Large U.S. entertainment company, everything I do in this class, I'm going to apply on Disney. So when we measure risk, I'm going to measure Disney's risk. When we measure hurdle rates, I'm going to measure Disney's hurdle rates. When we talk about investment decisions, I'm going to talk about a Disney theme park in Rio. You say, I've never heard of it. We're going to make it happen. We say, how would you assess it? When we talk about financing, we're going to talk about the right mix of debt and equity for Disney, and we're going to end the class with the valuation of Disney. Everything in this class is going to be applied on Disney. The second company I'm going to pick is a company called Vale. Vale is a Brazilian mining company. You think, why are you going to Brazil and picking a mining company? To get as different from Disney as I can. Emerging market company, commodity company, and everything I do in this class, I'm going to apply in Vale. So you're going to see, you have to wrestle with country risk and the fact that it's a Brazilian company in there. Then I'm going to use Tata Motors. Why Tata Motors? Because Tata Motors is part of a family group, one of India's largest family groups. You think, so what? When you're a family group company, it's not clear whose interests get put first when you make decisions. Are you making the best decisions for Tata Motors? Are you making the best decisions for the Tata group? And you're going to see this dance all the way through the class. And it's not unusual. In Asia and Latin America, family group companies are more the rule than the exception. And it makes things really messy. We see a company do something really strange. Why did they do that? And you've got to step back and think about the family group. So I'm going to use Tata Motors to be. Then I'm going to use Baidu. Why? Because I've got to bring in a Chinese company. Why China is big? I call China the ultimate weapon of mass distraction. Not destruction, distraction. Because when in doubt, and my argument is not going, but there's always China. Notice how well it works. No matter how, what the plans are, we're going to be in China. It's amazing. That's it. The whole discussion is over. <laughs> I picked a Chinese company and I picked a technology company because I want to wrestle with what does it do investments for a technology company look like. And then I'm going to talk about Deutsche Bank because I like to talk about horror stories. <laughs> it wasn't a horror story when I wrote it in 2014. It's a full-blown crapshoot right now. Right? This is a company that seems to find a disaster every two years. So we're going to talk about what's different about corporate finance decisions at a regulated entity. And finally, I'm going to talk about a company called Bookscape. It's not a company. It's a privately owned bookstore in New York. I've changed the name of the bookstore because I want to talk about how does the owner of a small private business make invest. I almost picked the, hot, the, 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 the Euro guy outside. He's been out there. One of those guys, you know, has been out there almost 25 years. I know the guy. I know his kids. I know his kids, where his kids go to college. Do you think investment decisions matter to him? He bought a new... In fact, the fir, for the first 15 years, he used to be in this um, stand where he had to stand outside and cook, and then he bought the stand where he could be inside. I remember seeing it. He said, this is neat. When did he get it? And he said, over the summer. And he said, what did it cost you? $50,000. Big investment decision, right? The decision of whether to add sausage to the menu. He went back and forth on this. Should I add sausage? Should I not add sausage? You know why? Because if you make a bad investment decision as a small private business, you don't have the luxury to say, I'll go to the capital markets. What capital markets? <laughs> okay. And does he care about dividend decisions? His kid's going to college. 
you know one went on scholarship the other had to pay tuition